the people who sat down on the M25 who wanted us to um, insulate our houses, they're absolutely right. They're absolutely right that insulating uh, your house is the first thing you should do before you buy solar panels or do anything else. There's no point in that unless you've insulated your house. And we should have a national movement doing that. Um, so they get arrested for stopping us racing around on the motorway. Okay, maybe that's not the best way to go about their program, but it's going to cost something like 180,000 pounds to um, take them through the jury system, put them in prison, bring them out, the poor people. Um, why not take that 180,000 and say, look, rather than incarcerating you, here's 180,000. You show us how many houses you can insulate and how you would do it. And, and if you do it well enough, maybe we'll give you another 180,000 or, or more. I, I mean, I've always been interested in nature, but during the pandemic, of course, like, like all of us, the, the emergence of wildlife when we stopped being so busy because of the illness was inspiring. And, and I suppose I joined all those people who were thinking perhaps this illness is to do with the illness in nature, that our illness can't be separated from the illness around us. And if we're going to get our immune systems going to get strong, we've got to actually get the world more healthy as well. Um, obviously moving away from pesticides and all that stuff. And as I, I, so I started to get interested in a national nature service based on the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s in America, um, where, where we, would, we would pay our young people, anyone really, to, to get involved in, in restoring and recovering the natural capital, natural resources. I hate that word capital, but it's part of a good argument that any people's wealth and strength is directly connected to the nature that they live in uh, and on this island. And in my conversations with many different people restoring woodlands and uh, the rewilding and creating of biodiverse highways for, for species to move, I was very struck by a man, Tom Fewins, in a meeting who talked about wetlands. And I didn't know that wetlands uh, were an even greater capture of carbon than forests, and a quicker capture of carbon. And so I, I, my inquiries led me to him. And, and I suppose the other thing that happened at that time was the, the great campaign for a big program like National Nature Service, which I still believe in. I saw that that was long-term political maneuvering and work and campaigning. And I wanted something as, a, as an individual, as a, as, a, as a citizen, and even more than that, an animal on this planet. I wanted something directly that I could feel was more um, local and I could see results immediately. So I chose the Wetlands Wildfire Trust rather than all the larger campaigns going on. It's something that I felt I could, was local and was effective and I could be involved in. So was your wake-up call as a climate activist during the pandemic or, or, or does it predate that? No, it predates that. It goes back really to a love as a boy of uh, American Indian culture, initially the excitement of the stories. And then the more and more I got into that and read about many different tribal peoples, I, I loved their, you know, I was raised Christian, but it eventually fell away from a bit. And I loved their identification of God or the great spirit in nature. That always had a great meaning to me. And I found great peacefulness in forests and mountains and by the sea and so I, I felt I could connect more with a collective great spirit when I was in nature. So it came from that, from reading about indigenous people. But then obviously as the crisis became more clear and more apparent of how, how out of balance I was living as an individual with the nature around me, um, that, that's become something as I've matured that's become more and more important. And as you mature, you look back more and you think, what, am, what was I given as a gift when I was a child? I was given a lot. What am I giving to the children who are coming up now in the world? And, and that, that, that feels an important part of being a, a loving and human man, you know, to, to care for the children. You talked about um, 
uh, during the pandemic, you know, all of us waking up to the possibility that we could change things because things did change the minute we stopped steaming around leading our lives uh, in the way that we previously had. How did that uh, manifest itself to you during that period? I mean, we'll go on to talk in a bit about how intensely busy you were um, um, during that, that period. But in, in, in terms of just, I mean, I live in rural Somerset, so it was instantly very obvious. Uh, suddenly it was peaceful. Suddenly, the air was full of bird song. I mean, it was really quite peculiar. I felt like I'd lived through a, a nuclear winter and come out the other side. Yeah, yeah. I, I was in communication with many of my friends who were having a similar experience, both in, Earp, in, in London and also friends of mine in Kent, where my grandparents lived. I, I, even there, where they're not so uh, urbanized, they still saw a revival of, of insects and birds and animals and... I was, I had a very strange experience because I was working in a theater in America uh, just before the shutdown. In fact, I was, it was the last days of that theater, the Guthrie Theater, based on Tower and Guthrie in, in Minneapolis. And my wife suggested we fly for f five days to visit our daughter who lived in, lives in Joshua Tree or lived at that time in Joshua Tree in the high plateau desert. We arrived there and everything shut down. And we thought, we'll wait a couple of weeks. It was still impossible to travel. It was chaos back in London, and we ended up just staying there, staying put for three months in watching the spring emerge on the high desert. And the, the wildlife, the beauty of watching a spring and not doing anything really. At that time, there was no work, and I was working on this nat na National Nature Service via Zoom idea and talking with a lot of people about nature. But to see some of the oldest surviving species, the coyote and the roadrunner, these species that have survived many, many um, cataclysmic collapses of nature, um, and to learn about how they had done that and the interrelation of the plants and animals and the birds and the, the bees and insects. It, 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 was, it was an incredibly fortunate place for my daughter and my wife and I to have to hunker down for, for three or four months. I'm interested in your relationship between America and the UK because I noticed uh, at the beginning of our conversation uh, when you were talking about the nature movement in the US, you said we, and yet here in the UK, we very much think of you as ours. Uh, so who do you belong to? Oh, I, I belong in a bigger sense to nature, don't I? In Today, I feel with this kind of work, I, I, I'm part of, you know, the natural world. I... I I, I, don't, I feel there's a part of me that's like a plant, there's a part of me like a bird, like a fish. Uh, th that wonderful old Welsh Taliesin story I, I always has great meaning for me. Yes, I, yes, I work in two different nations because I'm not very good at foreign languages, so English is, <laughs> English is the only hammer I've got in the toolbox, or screwdriver. Hammer is not quite the right word for a language. But, so I, I'm fortunate enough to work in New York and in London in terms of live theatre, and also in the Midwest. But then my film work now increasingly takes me between the two countries, which is a challenge because it involves flying. And, uh, you know, that's not the most friendly thing to do. Isn't that um, one of the problems, you know, because there are always people out there who are very quick to um, point the finger of hypocrisy. And and in fairness, often, you know, some of the greatest proselytizers, proselytizers for uh, climate action, you know, fly around in private jets and, and you know, tip up at Davos, etc. Um, and, and Hollywood, of course, is, is not particularly renowned for its environmental campaigning uh, no, and or in behavior on film sets. No, no. Uh, Woody Harrelson is, is an amazing guy. He really makes a point in his contracts of demanding that the plastic cups and things aren't there, and I do my best to do that too. But, but yes, none of us are perfect, you know. I mean, uh, uh, from some things I read, turning to a vegan vegetarian diet is, is more effective than stopping flying. Um, looking at what, how many clothes you're buying in the food, there, there's so many areas that... So everyone must do what they can, do as best they can. But yeah, cutting down on flying is a good thing. 
that one of the things is, is, you know, we live in very prescriptive times. And actually, I think also social media makes it so much easier for people to just comment on what other people are doing than actually make, you know, small modifications to their own actions that will make a difference. So shouting at, at, at someone for flying uh, whilst at the same time, you know, eating a burger six days a week. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There's just so many different ways to approach it. And it feels like it's one of those areas where there's an awful lot of conflict at the moment. And conflict is the enemy of progress. I don't know about that. That's an interesting thought. I have to think about that. Striving in friendship, I think, is good. I think marriages are made up about striving in friendship. And, and often when the conflicts come up in marriage, it's, it's because something new is about to open up that's more beautiful than what you had, and maybe you're holding on to something that's lost its purpose. But I don't think blame and shame are the way to go forward. And I, I don't think... Um, I, I don't think negative things are so good anymore, too. Everyone's tired of being told how wrong they are, how bad they are. I think we've got to look for positive things. And that why, that's why the Wet, Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust is, is very helpful to me as an individual, because it's very positive. And, and uh, little steps are, uh, make a big journey, as the old sages say. And we mustn't, we mustn't degrade ourselves or blame other people for for not doing everything just because you can't do everything doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything um and so so i i, I look for the light and the positive steps forward it, it's it's not big plans that are going to do it it's each of us as individuals making little steps you're clearly very committed i wonder if you ever feel like taking more um animated action you know we've got groups like just stop oil and extinction rebellion who you know are saying that the the cause is so imperative that you know disrupting people's lives has to be a part of it just to get people to wake up and 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 take action where where do you sit in that argument i've been on many xr um um events in london I found them the most conscious and inspired, very, very loving groups of people. They are, they're very frightened people and they're angry people. You, you know, um, I don't understand us spending all this money on Trident and all these other defense systems uh, uh, to defend ourselves from other human beings. We know that we're facing extinction. And we know where the enemy is. It's in our own consumption, our own behavior, our, our own way of thinking about our relationship with nature, that we somehow are separate from nature, that we somehow can dominate our way through anything that happens. That was the character I played in Don't Look Up. That was his view in Don't Look Up. You know, we'll just fly off to another planet when we've wasted this one. It doesn't work that way. And, and I don't think that's why we're alive here. We're alive to be together and learn from all the life on the planet. That's a much more beautiful life. But yes, some of the, some of the people uh, move towards more, more um, disruptive activity. The people who sat down on the M25 who wanted us to um, insulate our houses, they're absolutely right. They're absolutely right that insulating uh, your house is the first thing you should do. Before you buy solar panels or do anything else, there's no point in that unless you've insulated your house. And we should have a national movement doing that. Um, so they get arrested for stopping us racing around on the motorway. Okay, maybe that's not the best way to go about their program, but it's going to cost something like £180,000 to um, take them through the jury system, put them in prison, bring them out, the poor people. Um, why not take that 180000 and say, look, rather than incarcerating you, here's 180000 You show us how many houses you can insulate and how you would do it. And, and if you do it well enough, maybe we'll give you another 180000 or, or more. That would, be, that would be the way I think. If I had a child in my family who was very angry and breaking things, I don't know that I would just lock them in their room, particularly if what they said was making sense. I'd think, all right, Tommy, or what the little child's name is, <laughs> here's a bit more pocket money. You show me how you would do it better then. You show me how. I, I, just, think, I just think we should be, we should be channeling. This is an extraordinary energy. Uh, from all of these organizations. It's a passion, you know. These people are risking their lives. I've stood in Trafalgar Square and looked at old people gluing themselves to the road and thought, why aren't I doing that? Oh, because I couldn't visit my father or my brother or my sister in America. I wouldn't work again. And all those thoughts stopped me. 
you know, that my role is to be a storyteller and an ambassador like this. But locking people up, it's ridiculous. We should be clever and think about how channeling this kind of energy, when someone has a motivation like this, we should be channeling it towards the good, I think, rather than punishing it. Um, we're, 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 um, I'm, we're talking on the um, last day of COP27, and I wondered how you think that sort of individual radical action compares to what often feels like a sort of inertia, perhaps a grandstanding from politicians at these big events, but, but really, you know, not enough moving forward. I'm afraid I don't watch it anymore. I, I don't, I feel it encourages a certain voice in my head that says, oh great, those people are dealing with it over there. I, don't, I can go on, go down, go about my normal life. Those people are dealing with it, or the government will deal with it, or Greenpeace, or Friends of the Earth, or, they'll deal with that problem. And look, they can't even agree, so what's the point of me doing anything? That kind of negative voice. And, and um, to be honest, I've been busy, you know, preparing for this day and looking at the, the work I can do with youth, the work I can do locally in my environment. I, 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 think, I think we have to be careful as individuals not to shoulder this off to the government or to, you know, other people. It, it, it's not up to them, and, and they're not capable in many cases of, of agreeing on things. It's up to us to make the steps, and so getting in, choosing... A, an environmental group that you're impressed with, like I'm super impressed with the Wildfire and Wetlands Trust, and getting involved as a member, or reading what they're writing, the Blue Recovery Plan. It's a brilliant, brilliant, inspiring plan. 90% of our wetlands have been lost over the 500 years. Why? Probably because we've tried to utilize that land for some economic uh, advantage to ourselves. Wilderness doesn't fall into uh, depravity when left alone. So I think it's us interfering in our, in our, during our empire years. You know, well, thankfully we're done with that empire attempt to control the whole world, and we need to get back to who we are. And the the wetlands on these islands are very much important to the um, English character. So I, I I I look more locally. You know, I'm not. Because there are people killing other people in the world doesn't mean that I, therefore, will not agree to killing being wrong. I don't agree, think that you have to, you can only do things when everyone agrees. I, I think if we feel as a nation that we took down all our forests, burnt them all up, and we still are not allowing our forests to grow, but, but we're asking the Brazilians or asking other undeveloped, so-called undeveloped countries not to take their forests down, yes. We, we probably should be paying them something for that. We should probably be uh, doing something to balance that out in terms of our wealth. But it doesn't matter if no one else agrees with that. We, we should do what's right, not, not, not wait and give excuses to ourselves because other people are not doing it. You know, How well, much? Is the, is, from my mind, you know, that's the best way in this country to fight climate change. It's the best, quickest way to capture carbon and um, it has a, a number of, of, of uh, advantages for us. So but I'd like to think more locally and not, not worry about the big plans so much. You mentioned um, your part in, in Don't Look Up. I wondered how often uh, your choice of roles is impacted by your activism. I mean, I suppose in a way, you know, you could see Jerusalem, Johnny Byron, he was, he was a bit of an eco-warrior in, 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 in his own backyard, wasn't he? I don't. I don't know. John, you would think of that of that title, eco warrior. I think we'd more want to invite you in for a drink, Marielle. <laughs> you can still have a drink and be an eco warrior. Yes, you can. Yeah. You have to keep your. You have to be pretty sober when you're out um, on protests and things. It's not. You know. It's not a wild thing. It's a very, very organised, careful, careful thing that people don't get hurt, and the police are involved in that too. But in, in terms of, of your role choices, I mean, do you see these, you talked about yourself as a storyteller and, and that being the talent that you have and I suppose the gift that you can use, the, the skill that, that, that you can use. So does it mean that it informs the sort of work you want to do? I mean, you know, you've got a new movie out today also, uh, you know, uh, uh, which is um, uh, Bones and All, uh, which, which perhaps wouldn't necessarily be a, a particularly motivating planet-saving story. Well, it's an interesting story. It's a love story uh, amongst... Um, 
pe people who have inherited something from their parents, like we've inherited the climate crisis from our parents. Though I wouldn't limit it to be, it's not a, it's not got a, it's not pointing a finger like that, the story, but it's, a, it's like a fable, you, you know, where these young people have inherited cannibalism, like a Grimm's story, Grimm's fable. Um, I, I, having seen it a couple of times, it makes me think of what our young people have inherited, which is our out-of-control consumption of the world, which is not that far separate from us, and in fact we are consuming ourselves, really. So. It has a, it, in, when I chose the story, I chose it because I thought it had a relevance for young people, that they've inherited a lot of difficulty from, from us. And this was an interesting fable, exploring what do you do if you have a very, very difficult inheritance from your parents. But I, I you know, I'm very blessed. I'm blessed with gifts and I'm blessed with good health. I'm, and I'm blessed with 40 years of working on Shakespeare whose stories have been incredibly beneficial to me and many people and are very, very connected to nature. You know, the, the way that we describe our inner life is, is best done by, by knowing the names of birds and trees and salt marshes, peat bogs, river streams, brooks, all these things in indigenous society and in our own society before the Industrial Revolution took over were the very, very beautiful ways that we described our emotional states. So when I come into a place like this London Wetlands place, I am, and, and all the different, uh, the ten different um, wetlands places, I, I, I get language, like I do in dreams, for what's happening inside me. Um, and we all need a story. It's very difficult to live without a story of what a good life is, of what a good person is, of, of where happiness is. And, and so we're sold stories all the time by people who want to sell us things. Nature doesn't want to sell us anything. Nature just responds and is there and is making the necessary decisions. We think of wildlife sometimes as chaotic and tooth and claw and a place where there isn't peace. But um, it, in my experience being in wildlife in the mountains and even in a small place like this London Wetlands place, it's very peaceful. You immediately, I immediately feel myself settling into something that's m more natural. So yes, to, uh, a long answer to your question, but I do try and choose stories like Don't Look Up um, and other stories that I feel, I feel are beneficial rather than um, negative or depra depraving of, of people's humanity. I hope they're inspiring generally of love. You mentioned your love of Shakespeare there, and I know that it was partly prompted by the fact that your parents were English teachers and introduced you to, to Shakespeare from an early age. Um, I, I was struck by that because for most kids, that would be a recipe for disaster. I mean, you know, I presented a book program for 20 years, and to try and get either of my teenagers to look at a book is a real uh, effort. How did your parents open that portal for you rather than uh, make you feel like you wanted to swerve in a different direction? Because I think a lot of parents might like to know the answer to that. Well, <laughs> it, it was, my, my spelling has always been atrocious. I think that was my only way of revolting against my parents was to spell badly. So there was a negative aspect to them being English teachers that I, I was always terrified of getting words wrong, and I still can't. I still will look at a word like receive and not be sure whether the E or the I comes first. It's ridiculous. Um, they, but they, they inspired me with their love. You know, I wanted their love as a child. And when I saw how much my mother was completely affected by a Shakespeare play, she would want to just, if, she, if we'd seen Henry IV part one in the afternoon, she would want to drop all plans. She would announce to the family she was dropping all plans and staying to see part two. She had to, there was no option for her. And my dad would try and rationalize with her about what we had to do and, and how she couldn't do that. So I, one notices that as a child. One notices what one's parents love. Um, my mother also were, was an, a passionate lover of nature, of, of um, plants and animals and wild places. And so I noticed that too. So I think, um, if, I think it's the sharing of love that affects children more. These, these you know, br bringing a child out into these wonderful walkways on wetlands and stuff, or any, if you love forests or any of the nature you love, if you do truly love it, then that's, the child is going to remember that. And probably the child has a similar um, genetically inherited love too.
not far from where you are. And, and just finally, really, I mean, your support of young artists um, goes further than just starring in their films, uh, which I know you did during, during lockdown. You're a trustee of a youth theatre group, Intermission. How important do you think it is to, to help young people learn the art of storytelling and how disadvantaging do you think it is when great organizations like the ENO and Don Mar Warehouse and the Hampstead Theatre which sort of are, are startups in a way for so many uh, people's artistic careers find themselves losing funding? Well it's a very very good question I, I think I think um, anywhere in the world the, the arts and storytelling it is a crucial, crucial part of how we grow and learn and mature um, and become effective in the world. Um, you, you see leaders of corporations seeking advice from uh, theatre makers and filmmakers to learn how to help their organisations move forward. It's that important. They'll spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on it. So it's quite right that as a society, unlike America, a, a, a certain amount of our taxes go towards the arts and support the arts and hopefully make the arts affordable for all. This is the issue at the moment and I think where the Labour and the Conservative, the right and the left all agree that we need to give more access into the arts uh, it, as part of our levelling up of the great divide in society. So I, I want to say first of all that I am fully behind that and, and work actively for that. I mean, to some degree, it's also a leveling up of letting nature more into our consciousness as well. I think it's one, one in three people don't have any nature within 15 minutes' walk of them. That's probably more in cities. We've lost, a, I think, the Blue Recovery Plan wants to, re wants to create 100,000 hectares of wetlands in this land, and that's possible for us to do. That's not just for climate change, but it's also for our, our arts and cultural health. Now, when you close down the Ian or the Almeida, you're putting a lot of people out of work who work in the arts, who've had a rough time during the pandemic. So it's a double, t difficult blow, you know. Um, my concern is not only for the institutions, but for the freelance artists. All of the theatres, live places in the UK, 75% of their staff are freelance. And we got nothing during the pandemic. Even when the institutions got bailed out, they didn't even share 1% of that money with freelance artists. You know, we fundraised amongst ourselves to support ourselves. I, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing if the same people who work at the Almeida or the ENO have to move out and reach out into different communities. I suspect that both those organizations were already doing that. Hampstead Theatre, they already had education programs and they were trying to reach out. So I, I doubt that they were the ones to be slapped, that any of the arts are to be slashed back. But business people tend to think the arts are kind of badly organized and luxurious and they couldn't be farther from the truth. It's so hard to run a theatre. I ran a theatre for 10 years with no Arts Council subsidy, the Globe Theatre. It's hard work. And you pinch every corner, you pinch pennies, you cut back whatever you can. Arts people are very, very successful arts people, very, very good business managers. So I don't think there's excess there. Um, it's just, I agree with you know, Sadiq Khan, our good mayor, that, that uh, it's very important the arts thrive in London. People come from all over the world because of the arts in London. And so it's a foolish thing to, to cut it back. But we do need to get arts out into those communities, like the youth theatre I support, who don't have access into the arts. That's where the next stars will come from. And I know that that's probably why you're very keen to tour Jerusalem, which you seem to be intent on going back to decade after decade. <laughs> who wouldn't if they had the luck to find a wonderful part like that written for them, you know? It'd be nuts, wouldn't it? Who wouldn't do that? <laughs> it's like going back to your favorite restaurant. Sure, you try some other ones, but in the end you think, no, that, that, that restaurant around the corner is my favorite. And they know me there. <laughs> and I, I, think that, I think it's very hard to get into London now. And I, I guess, yeah, to do with that leveling up idea, the, the, I, I mean, I don't think of Glasgow, Dublin, Belfast in any way lesser than London, but I, I, I do think it'd be nice to, to take the play, which has a lot to say to people who live in these islands, in the different nations of these islands, um, I think it'd be nice to take it out there 
uh, in the in the next two or three years b- before I come back at seventy to do it again. <laughs> I can hardly wait. I'm already excited. Um, Sir Mark Rylands, thank you so much uh, for talking to me today. Well, great. Thank you. And can I just say one final thing? Yeah. If you're interested in what we've been talking about, which is the wet- wetlands and wildlife, yeah. the, the Blue Recovery Plan is on their website, www.t.org.uk www.t.org.uk. I think you'll find it an inspiring, inspiring, very hopeful, positive thing. I'm speaking with the listeners now. And becoming a member or help signing our declaration to get the governors of this land to back this thing would be would be re- really, really helpful. It's called the, the Wetlands Can Pledge. And um, we've got 11,000 signatures and looking for a lot more. But I just would check it out. I think you'll find it inspiring. And and there's one uh, all over the country in different places that you can go to. Thanks, Mariella. Thanks so much for having me on.